Welcome back to the fifth episode of GeoTV. We're so excited to have you here with us today. We're going to dive straight into the realm of super hot rock, SHR. Typical geothermal power plants usually operates around 100 to 250 degrees Celsius, but super hot rock contains temperatures above 375 degrees Celsius. We got the opportunity to sit, to sit down with Quace to hear about their recent research on how to utilize these hot temperatures. My name's Matt Hood, uh, co-founder, chief of staff at Quays Energy. We're working on unlocking super hot geothermal, which we think is the most viable approach to how we deploy geothermal at the terawatt scale, where we truly need it to make an impact on the energy transition. We're very focused on how do we access this heat by drilling deep, and how do we extract that heat through uh, reservoir creation to develop enhanced geothermal systems. Most of our company's history has been focused on the development of millimeter wave drilling technology, which replaces conventional bits with an energy matter interaction that can potentially drill independent of depth and temperature, which holds conventional drilling back from accessing these depths. Once we get down to our target temperature, we will then deploy fracturing techniques to create an enhanced geothermal system reservoir that allows us to harvest that heat over large surface areas and produce hot water and steam at the surface on the order of 20, 30, maybe potentially even 40 megawatts of electric power, bringing geothermal at parity with fossil fuels today. We believe that by going to greater depths, there are both higher temperatures and higher pressures and these have improvements to both the thermal efficiency of the cycle, as well as the utilization of the plant, and from a hydraulic perspective, the overall flow rate of the geofluid. We think that when you consider the thermal hydraulics of the geofluid production at a holistic level, that when you balance all those trade-offs, there's a certain uh, ideal target that emerges from that. So we're interested in that plateau as being a performance target for future systems. And that suggests that we may not need to go as deep as originally thought because of diminishing returns. Listen up, because time is running out. In the past 20 years, there have been almost twice as many extreme weather events. If we don't listen to scientists, things will be even crazier when we grow up. By 2050, heat waves will affect 94% of children in the world. Say goodbye to pool parties and playing outside. So, we need adults to, s to stop wasting time and instead get together to fix this totally solvable problem. It's not, it's not just our claim in numbers to us, it's our future. Women are underrepresented in geothermal. In the US, we make up about 15 to 20 percent of the workforce, but in technical fields, we're less than 10 percent. And we are needed if we're going to fight the climate crisis that it's currently going on. The people who knows a lot about this are women in geothermal, or WING, as they are more known as. Let's have a look on their perspectives as founders from new members of the WING organization. 11 years ago now at Geothermal Rising Conference, um, it was GRC back then. Uh, the Geothermal Resources Council. So we were in Las Vegas and um, this wonderful woman named Elise Brown from UC Davis had this idea to bring together women in the industry to see how we could continue to increase our presence as well as support each other and lift each other up. Um, so we got together on a balcony and had a huge brainstorming session one night. Um, the president of the board at the time was kind enough to lend us his suite and one of the companies sponsored some refreshments for us. Um, and so there was about 25 people there, both men and women. And we had big pieces of paper up on the wall um, and we were brainstorming and people agreed to work together. Um, so there was a group of about six of us, um, you know, myself, Andy Blair, Elise, obviously, and then a few people who are no longer in the industry who said, okay, we'll, we'll start, we'll take this on, we'll get it started. Um, and, you know, it was born from there. And it was really exciting. And especially at first, you know, as we talked as a group, we really emphasized the fact that, yes, it is women in geothermal, and our mission is to promote the advancement and education and opportunities for women in the industry, but that we needed to be a fully inclusive organization. Um, everyone needs to have a seat at the table. 
And our wingmen are really important to us as well. So, you know, wing as a whole has a goal to have 50% male membership because we're really an equality organization in addition to advocating for women. We are now officially the largest geothermal membership organization in the world um, with members in over 80 countries, which is super exciting. Um, and it's been really exciting to see all of the different member countries stand up and do new things and advocate for new things and determine what's important to them um, while still having the wing, larger wing community and you know, going to conferences and seeing people walk around with their wing pins and you, all, you, you know it's a friend, you know, even if you've never met before, you can walk up and say, oh, I see you're a wing member and introduce yourself and know that you have shared values. So I joined Wing USA chapter last year and I didn't really know anyone in the industry at that point, but when I went to the Geothermal Rising Conference, yep. I came across the booth and was like, oh, I have a community. Even though I didn't know anyone at all, I knew that I could go to this group and I could go to people with the wing pins on and they would be supportive of me being new to the industry, which I mean, the geothermal community is a very collaborative group as a whole, but knowing that my voice is going to be valued and my efforts are going to be appreciated somewhere, uh, that align with my passion for geothermal, uh, it was fantastic. And so I was able to get plugged in and help out just volunteering with WING and getting more involved with our different committees and efforts in order to help get students involved. Uh, it's been fantastic so far, and I feel like I belong in the geothermal industry now. Yeah, and I mean, Annalise was so enthusiastic when she found us at GR last year. Um, we've actually roped her into the board of directors for WING US's nonprofit organization. Um, and so, you know, it's really exciting to see new people coming into the industry and finding WING and getting involved. Um, you know, here at WING US, we're always looking for volunteers. I know other country chapters are as well. Um, so, you know, it's really important for people, if they believe in the WING ethos and our core values, um, you know, get involved however you can. It is now time to turn to our friends at Think Geo Energy for the latest and the greatest news within the world of geothermal. Over to you, Think Geo Energy. As every year, we've just recently released our top 10 of the geothermal countries by power generation capacity. The total installed geothermal power generation capacity at the end of 2024 was 6,873 megawatts. The top country are the United States with 3,937 megawatts, followed by Indonesia with 2,653 megawatts. Today, there are five countries that have more than one gigawatt of installed geothermal power generation capacity. Kenya is scratching it, uh, but is expected to enter that club in 2025. A total of 389 megawatts were added in 2024, of which the largest uh, station that came online was the Tahoara 174 megawatt geothermal power plant in New Zealand. Today, about 35 countries produce geothermal electricity and three to four new plants are expected to be added early this year. We expect that the total power generation capacity added by geothermal plants will around, be around 300 megawatts in 2025. After that, we expect exponential growth through new technology development and the pickup of development in the United States, Indonesia and elsewhere. But stay tuned and follow us on Think Geoenergy for further updates and our Global Geothermal Power Yearbook 2024, which we are to be releasing in the coming weeks. Data centers are the backbone of our digital world and they need reliable, round the clock baseload power. Today, we're sitting down with experts from Baker Hughes to hear about why geothermal could be the perfect match. So, geothermal energy has a lot of advantages related to data center uh, power usage. Uh, among them, you know, like if you look at data center operators and you talk to them, one of the number one things they're concerned about is uptime, is reliability. They can't afford for these systems to go down. You know, conventionally they have to have complicated, expensive battery storage. But geothermal energy, because of its, fir its firm, uh, you know, like resilient, uh, dispatchable energy, right? 
it, it really ticks that box. So that, that's certainly off the top of my head one of the most important. Uh, yeah, so just, well, just to add to that, you know, the, um, the great thing with, with geothermal energy right now is the development of enhanced geothermal systems. Um, and what that's doing is it's bringing EGS to um, behind the fence, behind the meter applications. Um, that's, that's, you know, that's not just data centers, but you know, a wide range of different uh, applications that need that form yeah. of energy. And just to build on that, when you, when you consider geothermal and the behind the meter applications, it's actually very competitive in cost when you look at actually you know, adding uh, infrastructure, transmission or pipelines you know, for fossil to a new data center development. The actual uh, cost is, is actually very competitive. Not to mention even when you compare to other renewables, the low surface land use is actually quite attractive as well. Yeah, and, and, and you know, the other thing as well is, is you know, it's, also, it's also heat as well as power, right? So, and when, what comes with heat is cooling, uh, which is kind of an interesting, is an interesting concept. But, but um, you know, these, um, these chillers that you're now able to bring in that are, you know, very high um, power chillers that allow you to take the heat from geothermal energy and turn that heat into cooling. So it's, um, you know, you can, you can hit both the power side for these data centers as well as the cooling side for the data yeah. centers. And, and you can build on that by even utilizing the waste heat from the data centers mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah. And you know, there's, there's, there's different ways of geothermal cooling. Yeah. Today, there are multiple projects in, in Iceland, in uh, Pennsylvania, even in Norway, temperate climates, where you're just using an extension of, you know, like what you do residentially, ground source heat pumps, you know, that, that actually provide uh, cold uh, fluid. So, so yes, it's, it's, it's very versatile and, 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 and really also, contrary to ma many people's beliefs, the, has the capability to be very competitive in this space. Uh, one last thing I would add is, you know, building on what he said about EGS. EGS involves large scale. You're not talking of a typical geothermal project of five, seven, eight wells. You're talking 50, 60 wells. So there is an opportunity to really scale, deliver cost savings, and bring on board the fossil or oil and gas industry's expertise in doing those types of projects. So, you know, one of the biggest challenges that geothermal faces with data center customers, with, with utilities on these uh, types of projects is today, there is no existing running large gigawatt scale geothermal project delivering power to data centers. So while we have the science that shows this can be done and people are doing it today, they're starting to do it, we don't have the track record. So when you have customers who come and ask you things uh, about water loss, about how, how, how you retain heat in these systems, we can point to the science to say, this is how it'll work and this is why it's not a problem. But we don't have a track record to show them with actual data that this is work for extended periods. So that for me is one, one big piece of it. The other big piece, and I, you know, we have lots of conversations this way, it's a hard, a hard uh, thing for our customers to get around the fact that they need to spend millions of dollars just to figure out whether it's gonna work. Yeah. Now, today, you know, especially with EGS, where, where you, know, the, the like, you can really increase the likelihood of success and you can use mapping and identify general areas where you, you, you've got a you know, great chance of doing it, you still need that exploration phase to figure out is it economic, how much, you know, like what sort of wells you need, how many of them you're gonna need. And that, that's a challenge for our, for, our, for our customers right now. I, I think these challenges can be mitigated, but I'll stop there and let Will talk well, about other challenges. I was, I was just gonna say that, you know, <laughs> I think you nailed it. The, the, the biggest one for me is investment. You know, we've got to, we've, we've got to, with all of these projects, it's all about getting that investment into the project and getting it in early at sufficient size to get over that risk profile, right? Because right at the beginning of these projects, you have this really high risk. You're exploring, you're looking for the, uh, the, 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 the temperatures in the subsurface, 
you're looking for the geology and all of that is you know somewhat unknown so and you have to actually get into the subsurface to understand that geology and that you know that leap from okay this site looks reasonable to you know we know we have a resource here that and and it's viable within you know the the parameters of the project the criteria to get to that point you really have to drill wells and though that that well drilling starts to get expensive so that's the the hump that the agit was just talking about getting that investment into those projects to get over that initial hump of understanding that we have a resource there and we can really take this and design it to, to fit the project's size and scope, that's you know what we've got to get over. So, but, and again, I, I think that we can address these challenges. So if you talk about uh, that particular challenge, you know, there are investors today because there's so much energy required for these yeah. data centers and you have companies with huge balance sheets willing to take that risk and other companies who, who are willing to build portfolios. So if you fail on one, you've got another one that you can go for. And you know, the non-invasive techniques, the mapping techniques to help narrow down prospects is also, I think, very important. And I think this comes back to the point where you know, oil, and gas, oil and gas companies, legacy companies like, like Baker Hughes can really make an impact because you know, coming into Baker Hughes in the last couple of years, I've realized that you know, these, these, these companies, they understand how to put these, these business models together. They have the expertise and the ability to do that so they can make, really make an impact. So, but also to add, to add to what Ajit was saying, you know, a big thing with this is governments as well. You know, governments are getting behind these data centers because they see the opportunity there. They're seeing that, you know, and, and these are governments, this is broad globally, right? That, that you know, countries are starting to understand that this is, a, this is going to be a big, big market. Now, it has massive energy needs, and somehow you've got to provide those energy needs in a, in a green way. And getting that, um, that, getting that energy into it, you know, geothermal provides such a fantastic opportunity for these, these people. So, so the governments are getting behind this and starting to look at how they can invest and facilitate these things to get off the ground. So yeah. it's a really great, great future here. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think geothermal energy is an ideal fit for data centers and the bonus is it's clean as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another episode of GeoTV has come to an end. We're looking forward to seeing you again next time, but until then, subscribe, like, comment, and continue to spread the word of geothermal. See you soon and until then, Please remember, the Earth has power. Let's switch it on.